Hi everybody, welcome to the August meeting of Toronto Jug, just in time for September. We've got a Google Plus community that uh, Jeff started for us. We've got a meetup group that Adib started for us, and he might come later, he's not here yet. Uh, we have a mailing list as well. You can go to tjug.ca to find that. We announce all our meetings there. And we post our videos also at tjug.ca. Currently posting them to YouTube, formerly Vimeo. <coughs> Could be something else in the future, you never know. But we'll always have links at tjug.ca. News. News this month. There's an increasing amount of discussion about combining Docker with Java. Um, Dan sent me a link to an article where uh, technologists say, I think that's a great citation, by the way, that if, if you need to cite some fact, you could claim that technologists told you. <laughs> I think that's how they do it at Java World now. Um, that although JAR, and I, I stuck in war because it's actually probably more true, uh, files provide cross-platform packaging of code and configuration. Docker apparently gives you a lot of control over CPU resourcing that you don't get with just deploying wars to app servers. So that's an interesting thing. Uh, you can also pre-tune your JRE if you stick it in a Docker container because the, all the parameters that you <laughs> launch it with are part of the Docker image. So that's maybe interesting. I've never used Docker with anything yet. Uh, does anybody here use Docker at work? Or Yes, Mike? Yeah. Uh, I mean, just delivering stuff right now. Um, we, uh, we've sort of created some Docker images for our, our solar instances and stuff like that, right? So a lot of configuration you need to set that up. Um, and it's sort of like a one-step install for developers. We're hoping eventually to move it to our sort of QA direction. Cool. So you're using solar in Docker as a way to quickly bootstrap the development environment? Cool. Yeah, I think they still have the warning on the Docker site that you shouldn't use it in production, no, but I... Oh, is it? Okay. So it's approved for production use now. Cool. Yeah, the issue with it is that you can't, because it, it, it relies on um, the host for a lot of the configuration, like, for example, if you need to tune, like, uh, the kernel settings and stuff like that, um, it relies on the host, so it's not quite as independent as a full VM. Okay. But they launch super fast. Like, super fast. So if you're launching a solar Docker image, how long does that take? Nice, a couple of seconds. Cool. So it sends it to CPU resource control usage? Does it integrate with enterprise monitoring data? Uh, it, it's, I would, I, I, I'm not familiar with that myself. I would assume so. It's just, um, okay, I'm just asking. Yeah, no, I mean, that, I mean, I've been looking at more from the development side of things. Right. Really side of things so. I guess. Well, he's talked about deploying it to production, so. Right. Well, you could stick arbitrary processes in a Docker image, so I guess if you have some enterprise monitoring tool that you're using, you could put the agent for it in the Docker image and have it launch with the rest of the stuff. So the answer is almost certainly yes, but I don't know. <laughs> something I, something I want to play with, something that uh, would be a great topic for a future talk here, but I don't know a lot about it myself. So something else that happened this month, the news people got a hold of the fact that in the US, Python is now uh, by far the majority introductory language in universities. Uh, they say eight of the top 10, I don't know how they ranked CS departments, but eight of the top 10. What's that? Technologists probably ranked. <laughs> yes, according to technologists and academics. Um, yeah. Technologists, academics. Yes. Acknologists um, <laughs> use Python to teach coding. Uh, and they also said 27 of the top 39 schools, independent of CS, uh, use Python to teach coding. And probably the more surprising tidbit in that article for me was that uh, at MIT and the University of California at Berkeley, 
they are phasing out Scheme and using Python instead. And that shocked me more, actually. What's that? How they fail half the class? Exactly. How will they fail half the class? It's MIT. They'll find a way. Python has very few parentheses as compared to Scheme. So I don't know what they're going to do with that, with the parenthetical surplus. Uh, there's also something else that was announced this month um, for a future version of Java. They haven't specified which one, but not nine. They specify that it won't be nine. Uh, Project Valhalla is looking at bringing value types and generic specialization. I have to look the second one up uh, to Java. So value types are an extension of the idea that's been floating around forever in Java. I remember back when I was in university, people were talking about this, about instead of having auto boxing or boxed primitives, that there would be a way to sort of equate primitives and objects so you could have an int that you can pass as a reference to something like as if it was an object, uh, and that it would have a very um, efficient representation in the VM. So most ints, say, would be represented as 32 bits on the heap. But they would act as if they were wrappers for the primitives. So you could call methods on them. Uh, like you could say thing dot equals other thing, and they were actually ints and only took up 32 bits of memory. So there's been a lot of thinking around that. It got uh, generalized to the idea that instead of just having it work for existing primitive types, that if you create a type that is really immutable, like the class is final or it has a private constructor and all of its fields are final and it can't be changed after it's been created, that the VM could represent it somehow more efficiently and it would be as if it was a primitive type and not take up all the overhead of a regular object when it's on the heap. So that's something that's been in the works for a long time. Generic specialization builds on that by saying that these types can also be used with generics. So you could have, say, an array list of int, for example, and that that would be something special and that it would use up a lot less memory than an array list of integer does these days. So this is new stuff. Uh, you can read about it on the link that's provided here. I haven't read the whole article yet, but just enough to guess at what it means. So it's interesting stuff. We don't know when it's coming, but it should be a big win if you do a lot of immutable type programming in Java. As always, there's the Java event calendar. It stays up to date. If you want to go to Java events, that's the place to look. If you're using a tool, if you enjoy using it, if it's saved you a lot of time and effort, it would be great if you could tell us about it. So you can kind of use this as an example or um, you know, do, do something on your own. but five or ten minutes and we're going to try to put at least one of these in every meeting because it should be, should be fun and interesting. So I'm going to talk about uh, RabbitMQ and Lyra. So you've probably all heard of RabbitMQ. You've probably used it. It's um, a message queue that's used for inter-process communication across multiple machines or within the same machine. There's a lot of different ways you can use it, a lot of different things you can use it for. It's a really, really good piece of software, rock solid. APIs are really good. You don't have to worry about it. You just install it. It works. Um, it's very solid. There's a few problems with it. The API is not very good with error handling. So every time you send a message on RabbitMQ or want to receive a message, there's a chance that the, the call will fail for networking reasons, for uh, who knows what. The server's down. All sorts of problems can happen, and you have to do try catch blocks and all these scenarios. And if it's down, you have to reconnect. And it just causes a lot of messy code, and it, it just makes a big mess. And it makes your code very difficult to read because it's 80% you know, 80, 80 error handling and 10% real code and 10% something else. I don't know. Um, so RabbitMQ themselves have done a partial solution to this that came out recently where they have uh, an auto-recovery, but it only works for network connection errors. So you set your connection to auto-recover, and if there's a connection error, it will try to re reconnect. 
Um, but it won't handle a lot of other cases. So there's still errors that you have to manually check for and recover from manually if um, channels or consumers are, are part of the RabbitMQ stack. And if they, if they happen to be closed, that doesn't get handled by auto recovery. And you still end up writing a lot of code. So there's this, um, this little project. It's not very big. It's uh, one small jar file. And it's got a simple API that essentially provides a proxy to the RabbitMQ API itself. So they provide proxy, proxy classes. And uh, they, do, they do it through reflection, actually. So it tracks the, the RabbitMQ API very well. And it handles recovery from almost anything that goes wrong, from network errors to um, closed things to the server being restarted. It, it automatically fires off a background task and reconnects, blocks your, your call until the connection is available again. And it takes almost no extra code. You, you just basically have to tell it um, how to do its thing, and it goes off, and you don't have to worry about it. So it's a, you just add it to your project through Maven. And you give it a recovery policy. So when you create a new RabbitMQ connection, you tell Lyra how to deal with errors. You tell it how often to retry, how many times to retry, um, whether to do it continuously, whether to back off exponentially. There's a, there's a million different options for the recovery policy. So you can set it up exactly how you need it. And they come with a bunch of default ones. This is the one I always end up using called Recover Always. Basically just turns everything up all the way, and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, we have very few services that we don't need to recover. <laughs> so. It, it, it's worked very well for me. Um, it's also smart about how recovery works. When you make a call into RabbitMQ, if the connection's down, if there's a problem, it just blocks. Lyra goes, tries to rebuild the connection, takes as long as it needs to based on the recovery policy. When it comes back up, the call completes successfully. So you don't have to worry about it. Um, there are some failures that cause Lyra to abort, and there are critical ones if your password isn't working anymore. It can't do anything about it. It knows that it can't do anything about it, and it fires an exception. So it's, it, it, it's smart about what it tries to retry and what it doesn't, and almost always does the right thing. Uh, it also handles redelivery. So if you're receiving messages, you have unact messages in the queue, the connection goes down, it comes back up. Lyra is smart enough to re redeliver those messages to you. So we use RabbitMQ quite a bit. In the real world, we do digital signage. We've got screens everywhere. And all of those screens connect back to one of our servers for um, receiving real-time commands, either updates or us telling them to reboot or reload their metadata. We've got a whole bunch of out-of-band things that go out to them. And they just, they're supposed to sit on their RabbitMQ exchange and listen for messages um, and stay connected. And we don't want to worry about it. So, we, we wrote our own RabbitMQ implementation for this, impl uh, usage of the, of the API for this, and we didn't quite get all the error cases. We had some problems with it. We redeveloped it with Lyra, and it's been rock solid ever since. So even if you can't... Uh, I think it was yeah. <laughs> um, you know, that, that, that scary moment when you have to restart your RabbitMQ server when there's 2,000 clients connected to it, you hope they come back. You know, that's, um, that's, that's a really good use for this, because they do. Yeah, so, and there's all sorts of other errors you haven't predicted. There's weird networking, really slow networks, who knows. So these problems do happen, and it's really good to have a solution for it. So it's saved me a lot of trouble. I, it's saved Orin a lot of trouble. He's used, he's used Lyra before. I, I made him use it. Um, but uh, it is a really good tool. If you're using RabbitMQ, you should be using this, I would say. Like, there's just, they, they go together really, really well. And if you're looking for messaging, give RabbitMQ a try, because it's awesome there as well. So that's it. That's, uh, that's all I've got to say about that. But uh, that's a favorite tool of mine. So. Hopefully, we'll hear about yours in an upcoming month. Right. 
So we'll talk about uh, the first six enhancement proposals for JDK 9, which are these ones. Process API updates, improved contended locking, segmented code cache, lightweight JSON API, which uh, that's especially important to those of us who spent our weekend critiquing JSR 353, which is now in the doghouse. Uh, smart Java compilation phase two and modular source code. No, I don't. I don't think it will be called JSONP. <laughs> but first, what's a JEP? So it's it's a simplified uh, <laughs> <laughs> workflow for enhancing. This is the state transition diagram as proposed for JEP 2.0, which is a great simplification over the JSR process. That's the complete state transition diagram with the bold blue arrows representing the typical trivial path through the process. Anyway, uh, typically a, uh, the collection of JEPs will feed the uh, JDK and Java roadmap and some of them will get collected together into the umbrella JSRs that get put forward as a proposal under the JCP for the next version of Java. But this is like the lightweight process. Because if you don't feel like doing a JSR, just whip up a quick JEP. So first of all, process API updates. Has anyone ever managed operating system processes tried to create child processes in Java? I have. Did you ever wish you could like know the PID of the child process? Yes. Well, now you can if this JEP goes through. So yeah, first goal is to portably expose the PID of the current process. And of course, the challenge is always that it also works in Windows. Um, another goal is to allow gentle shutdown which I read as, they didn't say it, but I read that as, at least in Unix, sending signals to processes so that you don't have to just terminate a process. You could send it a signal. You can also enumerate all the processes in the system, not just the ones that you created yourself. Uh, you can check if a process is still live if you know it's PID. And the, there's a bit of a fuzzy one, which is allow access to system-specific process management APIs. I read this as being similar to what was done in NIO2, where there was sort of a, an abstraction layer done over the file systems, where you could get access to operating system specific features without resorting to native code. And I think that's going to be the case here as well. Moving on, improve contended locking. You win. So. <laughs> Somebody wins, it wasn't me. The goals here are to improve contended locking performance on Java object monitors, which are the things you get when you say synchronized on a method, um, or if you have a synchronized block. Uh, contended performance being when there are multiple threads who actually want to enter the synchronized block at the same time. Um, and there's a whole list of benchmarks I put in the speaker notes a list of them, but I don't see them right now. Uh, so some of the benchmarks were benchmarks built upon uh, Tomcat, uh, Lucene, uh, Apache, uh, Batik, and FOP, which are used for XML rendering, and a bunch of other things. So sort of inspired by the real world type benchmarks, looking at highly contended locking and making it faster. So just as a background, it was in Java 6, I think, that uncontended locking got a huge performance win that uh, they got the ability to enter a lock or a monitor that no other thread was interested in went down from thousands of CPU cycles to three CPU cycles, I think it was three. So if you have a synchronized block and no other thread is interested in it, it's basically free, and it has been for a long time. So this project is to work on making contended locks a lot cheaper as well. So you can have some sort of actual hot area that multiple threads are interested in be fast to enter and exit. 
Um, so that's the second goal is about that, what I just said, that we already have a very good fast path performance for uncontended locks that's not to be disturbed. And the other big goal of the project is to work incrementally and submit patches as they proceed. This isn't a rewrite of locking or anything like that. So as bugs and tiny improvements are found, they'll be contributed back to OpenJDK incrementally rather than as a big thing at the end. Um, turns out that OpenJDK and the Oracle VM also have internal monitors that are different from Java object monitors, and those are not within scope for this project. And it's also going to be acceptable if some of the benchmarks get a little bit worse, just a little bit, if, if others get much better. So how will they achieve this? The plans are to look a lot at uh, JIT field reordering and cache line alignment. So looking at how the hardware actually works, for what are the strategies for obtaining a lock, and trying to, people have blogged about this idea of mechanical sympathy for a while, to basically try to make the JVM understand how most modern CPUs work and to align the implementation with that. Um, there is a method in the VM called platform event unpark. It's part of um, waking up a thread. They're going to try and make that faster. Uh, speed up monitor entry and exit code, which I guess that's already been done as far as it can for uncontented locks, but I guess the, the long path can be optimized. And notify and notify all are objects. Every object has these methods, and if you're going to go to sleep on a condition, you can call notify or notify all to wake up the threads that are sleeping on it, and these can apparently be optimized as well. So. That's part of the plan. Next proposed enhancement for JDK 9 is a segmented code cache. So this has to do with the just-in-time compiler that's in the JVM. And again, the goal here is to take some commonly known benchmarks and make them run faster. So the benchmarks they're focusing on for this particular improvement are the ones that exercise the just-in-time compiler quite a bit. Um, they want to, other than just make things faster, to give end users better control over the footprint of the JVM as far as memory goes. And I have a slide on that just in a second. And also to pave the way for some future enhancements that are out of scope for this improvement, which are um, fine-grained locking per compiled code type. And again, I'm going to get to what those, there's three types of compiled code. I'll get to those in a second. Um, to remove metadata from the code cache so that the area of memory that contains code that was compiled by the VM will contain only code rather than code and information about the code that was compiled. And again, this goes down to performance because the more compact you can make the data that contains the code, the more of it you can fit in the same area of cache. And of course, cache <coughs> memory is very uh, scarce at runtime compared to main memory, which is large. You say, well, we could always buy more RAM, but we can't always make the cache get twice as big because it's inside the CPU. Um, and to also separate code that was ahead of time compiled from just in time compiled from compiled for running on the GPU, which is becoming more and more of a performance area for Java. So the three regions of code are, uh, it's called non-method code, which is code that the Java compiler made for itself. So I did a bit of digging on that because they didn't say what that was in the JEP, but uh, the Java compiler needs to create some caches and buffers for itself to just, for bookkeeping. And those get stuck in the same area of memory currently as compiled code from your own methods does. Um, there's also the JIT interpreter itself, JIT, no, the bytecode interpreter itself, the one that runs your non-compiled code. Uh, that gets generated apparently when the JVM launches and it's generated in a way that it takes advantage of all the features of the CPU that it's running on. 
So the thing that actually runs your bytecode is optimized for your CPU, and that interpreter gets stuck in the code cache along with all of your own compiled methods. So those are the non-method code type. They stick around forever. They get generated when the JVM launches, and they never go away. There's also uh, profiled code is another type of code that gets stuck in this cache. And that's when uh, you're running tiered compilation, which is the default, I think, since Java 6, that when you're running code, at first, it gets compiled into machine code with a lot of probes and counters. And it will run, the method will get invoked thousands or tens of thousands of times with these counters in it. And those counters say, like, how many times did this loop execute? How many times was this variable written to versus read? And things like that. And these are not meant to be permanent. These are just there for measuring what the code does before the final compilation step happens. And the final compilation step uses the information about this loop that runs on average 37 times. So the final code that's compiled will maybe unroll a for loop to be 37 copies of itself, so there's no branching when the loop happens. Um, so this temporary code goes in and out of the code cache and can cause fragmentation in that area of memory, whereas the non-profiled code is the final result after having run the lightly optimized code over and over again, and that stays in there typically forever. Uh, it might get removed if the class is unloaded, but other than that, it just stays. Um, and then there's this process called the cache sweeper that looks for stuff in the cache that we don't need anymore. And currently that scans the whole code cache. So I made a little picture. So say the blue stuff is the permanent entries that are made by the VM. The yellow stuff might be the profiled code that's in there temporarily until it can be compiled permanently. And the red stuff is the really permanently compiled code. Uh, currently, it's all mixed together with its metadata. And when that cache needs to be cleared out for stuff that we don't need anymore, the cache sweeper runs through the entire area of memory. And that has all the costs associated with it of knocking all sorts of stuff out of the L1 cache because it doesn't all fit. So the idea now is that after this JEP goes through, the code sweeper only needs to run through the yellow and red areas of memory. We can skip the blue area because we never need to evict anything from that part of the cache. And we'll have better locality of access and hopefully use the hardware that's available to us more efficiently. Next is the lightweight JSON API. So we had a adopted JSR thing for JSR 353. You know, Mike participated. Habib was there as well. So JSR 353 apparently is never going to become part of Java SE because now there's a new JEP uh, to provide a JSON API that's going to go under java.util for parsing and generating JSON. It has basically the same structure as JSR 353. It's just going to have a different API. It's going to give you the ability to stream tokens. So you give it a JSON file, and you get tokens like, here's the beginning of an object, here's the beginning of an array, here's an array entry, here's an object value, and so on. Uh, it will also give you more of a, a contextual event stream where it says, here's an array item, and it's in the context of an object and a nested array, and so on. So you can find out when you get the event what it's, this piece of data is contained inside of. And then also in an immutable tree API where you can say, just parse this whole file and I'm going to walk through it by digging through objects, kind of like we do with DOM in XML. It will also include a transformer API because this tree API that they're proposing, it will be immutable. So unlike DOM, you won't be able to set attribute values or add child nodes. You'll get the tree that represents the JSON that you parsed. And you will not have any methods to set attributes or add or remove child nodes. But what you will have are simple methods for getting a similar tree with or without some change. Yes? Um, is any sort of schema analysis or validation going to be part 
I, no, they didn't mention that. Is there a, a, like a well-accepted JSON schema well, technology? It's been approved by anyone except people are using it. Okay. I'm just curious as to where that lies. Right. There was no mention of uh, any schema analysis. They mentioned the RFC for JSON as that that was a goal to comply with it, but they didn't mention any schema or conformance analysis. Uh, so I think the, the big reason this is going to happen instead of JSR 353 is that it's a primary goal of this effort to take advantage of Java 8 and 9 library features, which would especially include the uh, streaming collection APIs. So the non-goals are things that they're not going to do, or is it, it could happen, but it's not primary? Um, yeah, they didn't say they were anti-goals. <laughs> so if it, if it happens to be compatible with JSR 353, that wouldn't be a failure. But it's specifically not a goal of the, of the effort. Yes, I have a feeling JSR 353 will fade away once, once the core library contains a JSON API that does exactly the same thing. Right, so uh, JSR 353 also didn't have that as a goal. And did, you say did or did not? Did not. So there's currently no part of Java automatic binding between JSON and Java objects. It was a plan to follow on from JSR 353 in the future to add on top of it uh, some sort of binding API. But I haven't seen anything about that effort getting started yet. It's, I, I think it's still going to happen. I just don't know when. But it's possible at this point, now that we've seen this, that binding API for Java EE may be built on top of this rather than JSR 353. So everyone will use JSON for the seven days? Yes, and uh, Jackson. Yeah. OK, the next one is interesting. It is about is smart Java compilation. It's about a tool called sjavac that I had never heard of before today. Um, it's a new wrapper for the Java compiler that works a little bit differently from the Java C wrapper that we're familiar with. Um, so I should start by saying, what is S Java C? S Java C, actually I had a slide for this. Is it, the, is it next? Oh, there, yeah, I got it backwards. Um, it's already been proposed and completed in a separate JEP. Um, the main features of it is that it's based on a server process. So as you're building your whole big multi-module project, as you launch sjavac in each step to compile each module, it checks first to see if there's a server running. This is like a local process that you can communicate with. And it will send all of the information about what needs to be done to that server if there is a server process. If there isn't, it will start a server and send the information to the server. And the server can do things like use more than one core at a time for compiling Java sources. Uh, I didn't write this down, but it will also, unlike Java C, if it finds classes that have native code, uh, so native methods, um, it will automatically generate the uh, C header files for the native code. You don't have to run the um, Java H thing to make your headers. And it will also stay alive after the compilation is finished. The, that forked process will stay alive for a default of 30 seconds to see if there's any new connections coming in. So as your build script goes through all your modules, the plan is that each module get, would get compiled by the same server that got launched as a side effect of compiling the first module. Um, it's also a major goal of this thing to support incremental builds. So even if that server dies off because you haven't sent it a build job in 30 seconds, it writes out a file with the state of all the classes and sources that it knows about. And when a new server starts up, it reads that file right away and it will avoid recompiling anything that it doesn't have to. 
Uh, so it has a really fast way of figuring out what the last process had done. Um, and the primary goal here is that uh, clean builds and incremental rebuilds of OpenJDK are much, much faster. So this has been possible to use as an OpenJDK developer for a while. The new JEP, the goals are to fix bugs in that thing that already exists um, and to make it usable for arbitrary projects. So if you have a very large project with thousands of or tens of thousands of sources, that SJavaC might be a good thing for you to use. Uh, the goals are also to make it now the default for building the JDK. So if you just fork open JDK and try to build it yourself, it will use SJavaC without you having to ask for it. Um, also to make SJavaC work more like the JavaC command line tool, which is also a wrapper for the compiler classes that come with Java. Um, so if you've got a big project, you could just use SJavaC and kind of guess at how it works because it would use similar command line arguments to JavaC. Uh, they're not planning to add any new features at this time, and they're not planning to rewrite the SJavaC wrapper just to make it work better and more like you would think it should work if you were already using JavaC. So I guess the Maven compiler plugin can just support SJavaC. Yes, exactly. Yeah, Maven compiler plugin should be able to trivially support this after this JEP goes through. Yeah, that, uh, if you're using SJavaC wrapper, they should both contact the server. Oh, if you're running it with different um, class paths for the compiler? Yeah, like if you had, if you're running a That's a good question. I would guess not. Yeah, yeah I think so you'd need two different. Right. So for example, while I was reading about this, uh, they talked about that, that uh, SJavaC supports a class path like JavaC does today, or as always has. It also has another argument called source path, where you can specify a separate group of Java sources that are only used for resolving information that's needed to compile the classes you want. So you can have a source path argument where you give uncompiled Java sources, and it uses those just for information, and it doesn't ever try to compile them. That's something that Java C doesn't do today. You can put all the sources that you care about on the Java C command line, and it will compile the ones it needs. But S Java C can actually use sources without ever trying to generate <coughs> class files for them. Um, so that's a new distinction that wasn't in Java C. So you use them for what exactly? Uh, so say you refer to a constant in another file that you haven't compiled yet. Um, S Java C would be able to extract the string or integer constant out of it and compile it into a class file without compiling the source file that it came from. Because those are. Well, that's how Java C already works, but it had to make the class file before it could do that. Um, string, like static final strings and integers are always copied by value by Java C. It's in the Java spec. So if you have a constant integer or string defined in some class, and you change the class, even if that class is on the class path, anything that was compiled against it before you change the constant has the old value. Does it smart enough to know about the uh, dependency that you recompiled, or if that file is going to be changed? So if you have a dependency from the source path for a constant that's compiled into something that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. My answer is I hope so, but I, <laughs> I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. Java C is, if you give it the sources again, it will recompile, but I don't know about S Java C. Said that. So the strategy for this one is again, it's very similar. Um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. It's very similar to the first one I talked about, whatever that was, in that they're planning to be very incremental in the approach here. It's not a rewrite. They're going to fix known bugs, try to contribute stuff back as it happens, as the project progresses, rather than as one giant patch at the end. Uh, they are planning to, they said refactor, but I read it as rewrite the network protocol between the S Java C client and the server that it forks. 
Um, I mentioned that they're going to align the command line argument syntax with Java C so that it's more natural for us. If we choose to use S Java C, we would be able to use all the familiar command line arguments. Um, this is one uh, that, so Java C is actually a wrapper around the Java compiler that's built into the JDK. S Java C had been like more obviously a wrapper in that currently you have to run it as a jar file and pass arguments. So you're like Java dash jar, S Java C dot jar dash whatever. Um, they're gonna modify the internal API that both Java C and S Java C are wrapping to support resource sharing. So if you're compiling on multiple threads and say you don't know what Java Lang object is yet and you need to go to the source to find it, that those threads will know to wait for each other and it will only try to compile that like Java Lang object one time. Uh, currently, S Java C uses multiple cores, but if there's any sort of race like that where two threads are progressing and each of them doesn't know about Java Lang object yet, they will both compile it. It doesn't matter because they'll come up with the same result, but this enhancement is to avoid doing any kind of redundant work. And also share in memory structures between threads, which the current one doesn't do. And finally, modular source code. This is the first baby step in Jigsaw. It's like really happening now. So it's quite a modest proposal as Jonathan Swift said. Um, it's just to reorganize the source code in the JDK project. That's it. Uh, the directory structure right now has a few idiosyncrasies. Uh, for example, all of the native Unix code that's in C and C++ files goes under a directory called Solaris. They're going to rename it to Unix. That's one of the things they're doing. Um, more importantly, they're dividing, uh, I should have got the picture, I didn't. Have you guys seen the picture that was in the last two Java 1 keynotes of all the different packages that come with Java SE and they've been divided up into sections that are independent of each other? No? There's, I don't know, like about five sections that Java SE can be divided up into where there's like a minimal core and then there's some other parts that depend on that minimal core and some other parts that depend on those and the minimal core and so on. It's basically reverse engineering a set of modules out of Java SE based on how it's evolved over the years, just luckily. Um, so that's, that's been in the works for a while, this analysis of Java, just the, the emergent property of how Java was developed happens to cleanly separate into a handful of modules. They're going to actually reorganize all the sources from Java SE's standard library into those modules which have been sort of discovered from what was put in there. Um, and they're going to enforce those boundaries. So going forward, when people make changes in the Java library, the build will now fail if you violate one of those <laughs> discovered boundaries between the modules in Java. So that's an obvious preparatory step for making them into actual proper modules that can be distributed separately. Which brings us to the non-goals, which is that they're not actually going to break up the distribution into modules, but this is a not even necessary, but convenient first step towards doing that, towards delivering that uh, jigsaw idea that was uh, promised for Java 7, and then deferred, and then promised for Java 8, and then deferred, and now promised for Java 9, uh, this doesn't solve it, but this is, uh, it makes it easier to deliver it. And yeah, that's the big finish. <laughs> <laughs> so, the lesson so. of the last one is being a Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs>